Hello and welcome to another tutorial by me, Balin. I'm a software developer who builds massive format interactive experiences and installations. If you're interested in having a custom experience or installation built, contact me in the comments or send a message. This isn't a sponsored tutorial. Uh, I've built all these instructions so that the field of interactive media can grow with the participation of more creative people such as yourself. Uh, remember to hit the subscribe button and the bell to get updates. Uh, and like this video at some point when you are satisfied that you like it because I need your affirmation. So during this tutorial, you're going to learn to build a game for full dome display with point mechanics, an intro and an exit system, and an environment. Uh, we're going to use the native animation system to make some simple animations that change that environment through the course of the game. No prior knowledge of Unity or game design is required to follow this tutorial, but it would help if you at least do the built-in tutorial on how to use the IDE and the names of, and know the names of the parts of it if you're starting with absolutely no prior knowledge. Uh, I'll, remember, I'll remember to say the names of things throughout the tutorial, so uh, as long as you pay attention, you should be able to follow along, even with minimal knowledge. It uses a what's called the LWRP, or Lightweight Render Pipeline Full Dome Camera uh, for Unity that I've made publicly available on GitHub to produce a fisheye render for display on an appropriate system. It also lets players use their phones to participate in the game, so up to 24 players can compete at a time. This is done through an open source web server, which you'll set up on a secure, free cloud provider service. Excuse me. I'll explain how to set that up on a free GitHub account and a free Heroku instance. Uh, now, I really love to code, and I build things in a variety of coding languages. I know that most of you don't feel that way, though. Um, I included uh, code that I wrote to make this and other game demos work in the dome at our local museum. You're free to use this code in your own projects. Uh, yeah, uh, go ahead and break it down and find the stuff that you can do with it. Uh, enjoy. The full dome industry needs as many open source tools available as possible to create interactive, immersive experiences. If you develop a novel solution based on this, please consider sharing it in the same way. Uh, I, that way everything grows. And remember to like and subscribe. M most of the components here are free, built with the Unity framework, asset store, or provided in an asset package that I am giving you here. The exception to this rule uh, is Best HTTP. It's a Unity plugin which is available on the Asset Store. It goes on sale sometimes, real cheap, uh, uh, but it's usually like $60. Uh, I know it's worth every penny of the $60, uh, and uh, you'll have to have it if you want to use all of the systems that I wrote for cell phone interaction um, so that you can interact with many people with a cell phone users. Um, so uh, it's a great asset, but you're going to have to pay for it. You'll need to buy it um, if you're going to follow along to completion. Uh, it's possible to script all the WebSocket data without that package, but it's way more difficult. Anyway, um, another handy download is Particles Bubbles. That's with a dash in between them from Playmint. It's free and includes some way better bubble textures than the ones I photoshopped. It also uh, used a free sound asset uh, called, sound, called Fun and Games. Uh, that I found in the asset store. Uh, it's, uh, you'll find credits in the instructions here, but if you look up fun and games in the asset store, uh, which we'll do uh, when we're doing the setup, that's, uh, it's, it's a good one to use. Anyway, um, if you're watching and following along, please make sure you have everything downloaded uh, and installed that you're going to need ahead of time. And remember to subscribe and click the bell to get future updates. Uh, I put all the full text instructions up on my website, cosmicorbiters.com. Uh, you should be able to find everything you need there. <clears throat> okay, so in order to get started, uh, uh, oh, Let's, uh, let's go ahead and zoom uh, out into our Unity uh, framework. I, I am only a little floating head in that, so I'll see you there. And in Unity, um, now you're going to want to launch Unity um, or launch Unity Hub. 
and start a new game. Uh, and in that new game, um, suggest uh, take the LWRP camera uh, uh, lightweight render pipeline uh, option on the lower right hand side. Uh, I didn't capture that here, so you're going to have to figure that out. Um, so um, we're going to go into the asset store. Um, okay, to start our project, we're going to go into the asset store. And inside of the asset store, we're going to search for best HTTP. And I didn't want the filters, I just wanted the search. search for best HTTP and it is it's great I've already bought it that's why it's grayed out import it you'll have to buy it 60 bucks a pop sorry about that there's a little waiting Okay, so socket exceptions, but those just happen all the time. Uh, I'm just keeping an eye on a console over here, which is underneath my face for all of you. So I went ahead and moved that out, and I am going to put the lighting box down there where, where my face is. Um, just so that we don't have things uh, that I'm, I'm seeing and you're not. Okay, and we've got best HTTP. I'm going to now add uh, another, I'm going to import a custom package. That's import package and custom package. Or you can just drag the Unity package file right onto the project uh, folder, right into assets, and it'll import it that way. Um, And I'm going to import the camera first, WRP, LWRP 360 camera. Um, this is going to take a few moments because there are some lighting components. Uh, and we have, oh my gosh, auto generate. Uncheck that while we're while we're here. And so now we have the camera and we have best HTTP. Now we're going to need that last package import package, custom package, bubble destroyer, unity package. And that's the one that's shared just for, as part of this tutorial. You'll find it on cosmicorbiters.com. Or there will be links to it on the twitch.io stream that is accompanying the release of this that for our, the immersive game jam that we're doing with Dome Lab. Okay, so all of the assets have been imported. Um, we're also going to jump on the back on the asset store here and get fun and games. Music fun and games right here by SD. Uh, it's free. Uh, imported into your into your thing into your game. Okay, now with all of that stuff downloaded, it is time to set up the, the, the game. Um, so go into Edit, 
and project settings here and graphics. Uh, your project settings is probably going to pop up in another window. Uh, I've got it set up so that it comes in on this uh, sub window here, uh, which works for our situation. But I'm going to drag it over to this main window so it's nice and wide. Um, and we want to set this to our EAC lightweight render pipeline asset that came with the camera. Okay, after you got the scriptable render pipeline asset set, then go into player and in player set the color space to linear if it's gamma. Um, and you'll want to name your game uh, credit and you'll probably want to come up with a icon of some kind eventually to add to your game to differentiate it uh, when you publish it but for now that is superfluous and we are only doing the things that are absolutely necessary to create a basic game that is a multiplayer uh, game in the full dome environment so uh, we are going to also press com command shift B and in the build settings window that, that shows up change the architecture to 64 bit so if it's x60 x86 then change it to x86 underscore 64 um, in the architecture tab if you're doing this on the Mac then it's only only 64 is available at this point but you want to make sure that you're building 64-bit applications unless you have a really specialized need for a 32-bit application only. Um, anyway, uh, and then after you've done that, go into your project settings, physics, that's up here, and you'll see cloth gravity and up at the top, gravity. And you want to change this from negative 9.8 Eight one, which is real Earth gravity, to 1, which is reverse gravity, very slow reverse gravity. Um, and that's going to make our bubble effect work in the rest of the game. So after you've done that, we're going to need to create or open the scenes folder. Uh, sample scene is probably in there already if you pick the default LWRP project. Uh, and within scenes, I want you to create a new scene. You right click on it and go to create and then uh, scene. And we're going to name this main. And then double click on it. And we're not going to bother saving any of the changes in the sample scene that it came with. And if you click on the scene area here, you will see that it is a big blank area. This is your canvas to work inside of. Uh, so we're going to go ahead and add a full dome camera to it. And that's from our prefabs area here. So we're going to drag it out of the assets and we're going to pull this 360 camera out. And that's the camera that actually picks up all of the information. And then we need an output module and we're going to drag the 220 output module out. And now our game preview shows this uh, full dome view of the area. And we will now uh, find the pivot object inside of the 360 camera and change the rotation value on X to neg 90. So this is the transform section of the system, and we're changing that to neg 90. And that changes our view a little bit. Um, that's the sky overhead, and there's the sun, and there's a pl an endless plane all around us. Uh, since we're viewing at 220 degrees, this, uh, this is a, a more than fisheye uh, view. And it, they look great on the dome, usually. Uh, so, uh, if you want, you can also use the 180 camera. It's just that some of the locations will have to be changed 
you'll see if you're assembling it with that camera. And um, I'll try to remember to mention when it's appropriate to move things around. Anyway, uh, go ahead and get inside of the camera, select all of the cameras within that, and change the background type to solid color, and then change that solid color to black. All right, and now we want to take the main camera and delete it, and we're going to go ahead and create a new display layer at 30 uh, by selecting the, the camera here, oh, the output here, and it has blank right now. So we're going to click on that and hit Add Layer, and then go down to User Layer 30, and name that Display. You can even capitalize it if you want. Uh, it doesn't matter, uppercase or lowercase. And then go back in and select the camera again, and or excuse me, the, the output module again. And it should be set for Layer Display. And you don't even have to change anything. It just uh, is a way to make sure that you know that that is part of the, the, dis the, the set of values inside of the, that camera. And then we're going to want to create a reflection probe in the scene. So go down, go into the hierarchy here, right click, and say in light, we want reflection probe. And set this, instead of baked, we want it to be real time. And instead of on awake, we want every frame, all frames at once. Woo! It takes up a pretty tremendous amount of memory, but um, hopefully we've got memory to spare in the machine that's going to be running this, because it is, after all, in a theater. So it should at least have a high-end video card in it, which can handle a reflection, reflection probe or seven. Um, and then um, that box size, uh, I changed it to 500, 500, 500. Remember to do that. Uh, change this clear flag over to solid color and make that solid color black, just like those cameras that we, were, that we did earlier. And then let's go ahead and select this camera, this output camera. And instead of doing a full 220 degrees, we're going to do 200 10 degrees, uh, maybe 205, um, uh, by changing this to 110 degree field of view. And uh, if you look in the in the game, there's no sky anymore, so there's not really a way to, to, to see what the effect of that was. Sorry about that. And then um, inside of this is a sphere mesh collection. I want you to uncheck size to ortho. Uh, that will keep it from going full screen to the to either side, which is a, a preferable in many situations, but not in uh, our own dome. Um, so here, so that's done. Now the floor and the roof have a stylized caustics effect that we'll build in shader graph. And it's just to get familiarity with the tool. Um, since we're using WRP, uh, let, shader graph is already going to be part of the project. So in the hierarchy, that's, that's up here at the top, create a new plane, and that's 3D object plane, and name that plane floor. And resize it to 100 in each direction. And then position it at Y negative 30. And the rest at 0. OK. And let's go ahead and create another new plane. This one roof. And we're going to resize it to 5,000 in every direction. Move it to Y of 100 in height. And, and then um, rotate X by 
180. So it should look like that. And then go down to the project and create a new directory if it doesn't already exist named materials. And in that materials directory, uh, create a new shader. in here sometimes. Okay, there's shader and unlit graph. And we're going to name that caustics. And pop that in here. Okay, here we have the caustics window, um, and and it only has, here are the shader graph properties here on the left, and a preview area down here on the right, um, which we can resize only from the lower right-hand corner. You see that little minus? That's where you can resize that, that output. And then this is the, the central uh, feature. This is the output uh, module of this shader graph. Um, we are going to need to feed this a whole collection of values. And the first thing that we're going to, to, to need uh, on the left of the chain is going to be a tiling and offset module. So you can uh, right click and create node or you can press spacebar and it gives you the ability to create a node. And we're going to say tiling and offset. And that gives us this uh, UV uh, set. And uh, this is green is going in one direction, yellow goes the other way, red comes up in the opposite direction. You can use this to get a grid, um, especially if you just take one channel of it uh, off um, in any direction. And uh, this is your tiling and offset module. Uh, and we're going to drag out of, the, out of it and into empty space and it will allow us to create a node. And we're going to do a search for gradient noise. And the input on it is going to be UV. So set it to that. So gradient noise comes into the UV. And, uh, and then that, that gradient noise is going to give us some texture for our caustics. And we're going to take that out into another um, filter called a Voronoi, a Boron, Voronoi. Boron, Boronoi, yeah. Anyway, um, call me out for mispronunciation there in the in the comments if you heard me say it wrong. Um, and I'm just setting the scale in this so that we have, uh, excuse me, the cell density. Well, I'm not going to set the cell density. Um, we're gonna we're gonna do that in a minute. But uh, this. This gives us the, the output that we kind of want um, uh, with the, the ripples that, 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 we're, that we're looking for. And we can just take that out and put that straight out to the color on our uh, object, and, and we'd be kind of done, except it would be black and white, and we aren't able to specify that color um, or the, the amount of uh, tiling and off repetition or the offset of the of the thing, so we're gonna we're gonna set those up as properties. Uh, in order to do that, the first thing that we're gonna need is a replace color module. So, okay, so we're gonna take this Voronoi and we're gonna go out to a new um, replace color, and that is we'll just look it up. color. And on this one, we want this from to be black. So we're going to leave it that way. And we're going to change the range to 0.5. So it selects a little bit more. And the fuzziness, we're going to leave at zero. And this conversion, the color that it's grabbing and changing to, um, we're going to need a parameter. So let's click on plus and go up to color. 
and leave that as named color and change that property because that is just atrocious. And I'm going to use a dark green color as my default. Make sure that the alpha is set for 255 there, not zero. And uh, we're going to drag this color out into the scene and then its output gets connected to the um, two box here on your replace color. So now we've got uh, a nice uh, uh, green front. And uh, we're going to need to go out to an, any other color as a background though. So let's take this out and create another replace color. And this is going to the in once again. And this one is the white, because we're going to need to replace the white in the scene. So now we've replaced the black in the scene with the color that we want things to be. And now we have the leftover white areas. And um, let's uh, set up another color input, and we're going to call that background. here and the conversion there should go to that and the range goes from 0 to 1.2 and let's set the fuzziness to 1. There that catches all of the, the, the white areas um, and, and replaces it with the background color whatever we set that to be. Um, so there's uh, lots of opportunities to mess with that at that point. Um, I'm going to leave it black. Oh. Uh, sorry, I'm going to leave it black. Okay, and so now we have the foreground and the background and the replace color. So we're going to minimize all of that. And we're going to get, take the output on this color replacement into color there. And now we have a working shader. Now I would like to be able to specify the tiling and the offset externally. So uh, these tilings are XY values. So those are vector twos. So let's add a vector two and call this tiling. And tiling out and it's going to default to 1 and need more window <laughs> 1 and 1 and then the offset oh tiling is out here and we've got to connect it so tiling is hooked into our tiling offset value Let's also add an offset because, boy, we're here right now. Might as well have an offset. It's not like these cost you anything. I mean, there are parameters to pay attention to, and they do cost some processing. But it's worth it to make handles available externally for all of the values that might be useful for your uh, animations inside of the game. And so now we've got this whole caustics effect built. Let's go ahead and save it by hitting Save Asset. And then we're going to go ahead and create a new material in here. So create and then material. And we're going to call the new material war. We're going to assign it the shader graph caustics that we just made. Um, I'm going to make it dark green. Dark green and black. Um, and I'm going to set the tiling here to 100. really only X 
and Y is going to matter there. Um, and let's go ahead and click on scene. And here is floor. And we're going to drag floor material out onto floor. Hey, how's that look? And there's our floor around us here. And yeah, we're going to leave that at 10 um, for the tiling on the caustics. So that's the material caustics floor. And then we're going to go ahead and make a duplicate by selecting floor and pressing control D or command D, whichever you, you have. And then rename this one roof. And its tiling is going to be 1000. And we're going to drag that onto roof. And it looks really far away uh, at that kind of tiling and, and, and detail. And that establishes our scene. And if we want to look at it, here it is. There's the roof, there's the floor and our scant objects, just the camera there in the, in the main scene. All right, so we want fog in this scene because this, this look does not really look very good. So we're gonna, there's not really a regular fog kind of looking thing in the WR, in the, by default in the, in the lightweight render pipeline. So we're gonna cheat. Um, we're going to make some boxes and a material and we're gonna, Put it underwater uh, with that. With that, and uh, so go ahead and in the project window, right-click in materials and create a new material, and use the lightweight render pipeline uh, unlit, not the lightweight render pipeline lit. The surface type instead of opaque should be transparent. Alpha is good, and we want to change the color to uh, all zeros except for alpha, which we want to be 90. And that gives us a really light gray. Um, okay, and then under here, under advanced in priority, set that to 5. And name the new material fog. You can indicate it and press enter or F2 if you're in Windows. And okay. And now we're going to go into the hierarchy and create a new 3D object. Uh, excuse me, a new empty object. And we're going to reset its transform. And we're going to name this fog container. And fog container, we're going to create a new cylinder. And in that, this cylinder is going to contain our fog. Um, oh, oh, I, I almost forgot to mention. Instead of rendering on the front, we want to render on the back face. Um, of the of the fog material, uh, so render face should be set to back on fog. Um, anyway, go back into the fog container and click on the cylinder that you so the cylinder that you just created, and remove the collider from it, and change the scale on it uh, to 100 and 500 tall and 100 deep. And then um, we want to drag the material. Oh, and we're going to call this fog layer. And I want you to drag the fog material onto fog layer. And if you zoom out a little, you'll find it here inside of your 
your your area. So um, you can now take this fog layer and duplicate it five times. So Control D, one, two, three, four, five, and then select fog layer one and set it for two hundred. leave all of the Y's at 500 and four oops and If you look in the game view, now we have a much better looking area with that murky underwater looking effect. And now I want you to do something very important that save your game. Uh, Control S there inside of the Unity editor. And also like my video uh, while you're at it. The next step is to create the bubbles that surround the players inside the game. And uh, that's going to be the creation of a material. So we'll go into materials and create a new material. And this is going to be a particle material. We're going to call it particle bubbles. And, and then we're going to go into lightweight render pipeline and leave it as particles and unlit and then make this transparent and change this base map uh, to the texture bubble particle that we that, that I included in the uh, kit and uh, and you might as well just leave this gray color um, and go ahead and get into the hierarchy and right click in there and hit create empty and reset oh sorry not create empty um, go ahead and create a new wind zone and it's under 3d object wind zone and uh, that's in your hierarchy um, and leave it in directional drop the main down to 0.5 and leave the rest of the settings default and then duplicate that wind zone and then change the mode on that from directional to spherical change the radius to let's say five and change the main to two on, on the spherical one and then we're going to create a new particle system called bubble ring so that's going to be an effects particle system and then reset and change the y to negative five on the position and then rotation so it should go to neg 90 and then assign the bubble the particle bubble material to the renderer uh, i'm not sure if, yeah you can just drag it right onto the hierarchy item or you can open up the renderer in here and put it on material it looks like it assigns it to both trail and material if you drag it onto it in the uh, particle system. So that's kind of a handy thing, huh? Um, <coughs> after you got that, uh, go to the top, change the duration from 5 to 10, and change the lifetime to random between two constants, and it should be between 5 and 20. And then change the speed to also random between constants and you should make it 0.3 uh, to um, let's see what one okay and then start size should go way down to 
two randoms being constants, so we want it to be between 0.1 and 0.5. And then let's set up a gravity modifier on these of 0.1. It's going to make them rise in the world. And then simulation space changes to world. Uh, that's so that they interact with world things like our wind zones that we set up earlier. Um, they're called wind zones, but those are actually going to be our currents, our water currents. Um, and then uh, we're going to make sure play on awake is checked. And then max particles should still be a thousand. And then change the shape from cone uh, distribution over a circle and set the radius on that circle to 10 and then we want to change the radius thickness to 0.1 and that way it just comes out of the edges around the outside of our of our bubble um, and here's what that looks like in the scene view um, you can be working from either right now uh, but uh, so let's increase the overall. Oh, we also want to uh, change the external forces toggle. Check that. And, uh, and let's see how that looks in the game. Oh, hey, they're all blowing over. Isn't that cool? Um, and then we also want to uh, create a new color over lifetime and in this we're going to just click on that white bar that's a gradient to create a new gradient and uh, create a gradient with two edge fades that are really close um, I'll try to put together a I'll try to put together a video of this I, I realize it's not capturing but there's the edge fade and the edge fade um, the the top part of the gradient is the place that you're checking um, and uh, yeah then we're going to make sure this is named bubble ring and we're going to duplicate it I press by clicking on it and going to duplicate and then we're going to call this one bubble ring outer and bubble ring outer has the difference of being larger with a radius of 20 and having larger bubbles um, with a start size of 0.2 through 0.5 and it's also got to go down a little bit to neg 12 instead of neg 5 in, the, in terms of its positioning uh, so now with the two of them selected together uh, you know what I don't think I changed emission yeah, let's change emission. I have both of them selected, and I'm going to change the emission to 100. That's going to give us a lot more bubbles, um, which I think looks better. Uh, it gives us a little bit more of an uh, ambiance, uh, oh, however the French say that, um, ambience. Um, uh, and uh, the uh, next thing is to add an audio setup. Uh, and this is a really simple game, so we're going to use really simple audio setup. So right click on assets and go to create an audio mixer. It's all by itself, so that, can, that throws me off all the time. Oh, we don't want it named new audio mixer, though. We want it named bubble mixer. And double click it, and it will open the audio mixer editor. And in the audio mixer editor, we're going to create two new groups. Uh, first group is called SFX. And then click on master again, click on plus, and then BGM. And so now we have two groups uh, that we can drop all of our sound effects into. Um, I want you to drop the sound level at a neg 14 attenuation to BGM and then also add a duck volume to it and that duck volume needs a sender and sound effects is going to have a send that is connected to 
feedstock volume, and its send level should be at neg 40 dB. So that uh, that sends uh, a 50% volume essentially uh, out to uh, duck, uh, the duck volume function and ducks the background music by that kind of uh, degree. Um, and then we want to also add a normalization pass to master, which uh, keeps you from changing the volume uh, really suddenly. Uh, and then um, we're going to also add a uh, sound effects reverb and wet the sound a little by making it neg 300 uh, dry level. And, and this is when you can also set the exotic sound system that you're connected to in your project settings. Um, your project settings include an audio area um, and the default speaker mode has all of these options of surround, uh, quad, mono, whatever your uh, immersive scenario has available to it, you can uh, configure that here. And, and the next thing that we're going to do is to build a prefab uh, for the player. And we're going to do that um, in the first at the project view here. Uh, we're going to create a new material, which seems to be the thing that we begin everything with. So click on materials and right click and go to create. And we're going to call a create a new material called ping rings. And we're going to set the shader. Uh, it's currently set to lit. We're going to set it to lightweight render pipeline unlit. Um, and then we're going to make the surface type transparent and we're going to put the rings texture, the ping rings texture that it was provided uh, in the uh, bubble destroyer package um, on that. And then we're going to create the player. Uh, so in hierarchy, right click and go to create empty. And we're going to, in the transform of the new empty object, we're going to reset it. And then we're going to rename it player. And then we're going to add a player controller and a color thing script to it. text object. So 3D object and 3D text. And we're going to rename that symbol. Now that this symbol is a child of the player object, so that means it's going to inherit the transform and rotation values that are changed on player. Um, that uh, That's going to be handy because we are going to control those position and rotation values with the player controller module. Um, so let's set the transformation on this symbol to neg five. So it's always going to be five away from the center point, um, which is the player viewpoint. And we're also going to scale it down to point one, ten percent of the original size. And then we're also going to set text to at and the anchor to uh, might as well look in game here and see what's what's happening. I think that's our icon right there, um, and it should be five, not negative five. Uh, and center alignment. change the font size to 20. And yeah. 
Yeah. Then we're going to take this symbol object and we're going to click on player and we're going to drag the symbol object onto the symbol container um, variable here of player controller. We're also going to drag it into the objects to color array and it will get added to that array in color things. So color things can color a wide variety of things. And we're going to change this to base color as the attribute that it's going to set. Um, and then we're going to right click on player, uh, create empty, rename it hinge, and then add a component to it. Search for hinge and add a hinge joint. Um, in the rigid body, check all of the constraints. We don't want it going anywhere on accident. Um, and then click on player and drag the hinge onto the hinge object, uh, the hinge property of the player controller of the player. Um, all these terms are super important for lots of people that are trying to communicate ideas to one another. So I need to remember to reinforce that in, the, uh, in my own presentation. Um, so uh, next part is to add the ping marker that we prepared for earlier. So the ping marker helps people find their way. Um, we're going to add a 3D object to player by right clicking on 3D object, uh, right clicking on player, then going to in the hierarchy and then going to 3D object and then going to quad. Um, and we're going to immediately remove the collider component uh, from this quad and name it ping rings. Uh, ping marker, actually. <laughs> ping marker. And then we're going to drag the ping rings material that we made earlier onto the ping marker. Um, and uh, then we're going to set the ping marker to a Z of 5. And that makes it show up for us here in, in space. Um, and then we're going to set the scale on it to zero across the board. And we're going to add an activation timer component to ping marker. Um, leave it set for a duration of one. And then also add an audio source to it. Audio source. And the audio source wants an audio clip uh, added. And there are some sounds that are here. One of them is a sonar noise. Go ahead and drag it into the audio clip. Um, and then also uh, set the output to this. Oops, there's a ping marker. Set the output of the audio source to the SFX channel on our mixer. And then set the spatial blend from 2D over here all the way over to 3D and set the max distance to 20 on the, on the sound. Um, and we're going to add a pitch ranger. And then this pitch ranger needs to have the audio source mark. So we're going to drag the ping marker uh, from here onto the audio source here and leave the pitch range uh, where it's at. Um, make sure that play on awake is checked on your audio source and not loop. Um, okay, and then we also want to put this on the objects to color. And drag ping marker onto objects to color and um, we're going to uncheck it to make it inactive. Because uh, we don't want it just showing up automatically. And we're going to create a new animation for it. So I want you to save your game. That's Control S. And uh, then, or Command S, depending on if, what platform you're on. Um, 
so in player uh, I want you to click on ping marker and then I want you to find the animation tab in mine it's down here at the bottom if you don't have an animation tab available you can click on window and then go to animation and animation or press command or control 6 um, to get an animation tab uh, and it has a message in the middle of it that says to begin animating ping marker click create an animator and an animation clip that's really helpful but uh, it'll do it all for you if you just click the create button so click the create button and then you're going to have the option of, of selecting what folder you want it to be in it's going to show you your assets folder um, I usually create a new folder called animations um, and uh, use that as the place that I store the animations. Um, so create a new folder named animations in your file browser um, and then name the animation ping marker. And it'll automatically attach that animation with an animator uh, and a controller um, that it saves inside of that animations folder so that it names automatically according to whatever it is that you uh, added it to. Um, so with that controller you can with that ping marker selected press the record button in the animation bar and then ensure that the time is set to zero. That's the frame, the time frame. And uh, with the time frame set to zero go to the top scroll of ping marker here and change any value on the scale to, to, to anything and then back to zero again. That will record that it is zero right now. And then advance 10 frames. So hit type 10 and press enter. That will take you right up to 10 frames. Um, and then change the scale to 1. And then we want to advance another 10 frames to 20 and change the scale to 2 and then another 10 frames uh, to 30 and we're going to set the frame back the scale back to 1 again and then another 10 frames up or excuse me another 20 frames up to 50 and we're going to go back up to 2 this give it kind of a bouncy effect in terms of the, the overall resizing. And then at 60 frames, we're going to set it to zero, the original state that it came in at. And then we're going to click on record again, and that ends the recording session for the animation. Hooray! We just made an animation. Um, so now in assets, you'll need to make a folder called prefabs. So click on assets, right click, create, go to folder, and name that prefabs. And it's fabulous. Prefabs, get it? Um, yeah, no, it's not funny. Uh, drag player into prefabs, and now we have a player prefab. And also, while you're at it, go into the animations, click on the ping marker animation here, and uncheck loop time. So that's just in case if, you, if your timer uh, doesn't match with the, uh, the removal of the object, which shouldn't ever happen, but you know, um, it's a good policy to, to set non-looping non -looping animations not to loop. Um, and uh, yeah, we have player set as a prefab so we can now delete the player that we built in the scene so i'm just going to delete that player and uh, remember to save your game now we're going to create the score canvas so in the hierarchy uh, go ahead and create go to right click and go to ui and then canvas in the canvas, uh, change it from screen space overlay to world space, and then reset the rec transform. 
and then um, set the position uh, to 50 on X, Y uh, to neg 6, and the width to 1,000, and the height to 100, where it should already be. Set the rotation Y to 90 degrees, and then set the scale uh, to 10% in every direction. And then add a horizontal layout group. All right. Uh, change the upper left value here um, to middle left. And this canvas should be named score canvas. Um, the event system will automatically get added as soon as you add uh, these kinds of uh, objects to the scene. Um, don't worry about it. it. We're not using it really in this game. Um, well, you could use it if you wanted to add uh, traditional uh, mouse input, but we're using cell phone input uh, for this. So um, go ahead and save your game. And we're going to now make the play player panel prefab. Now, the player panel is a panel that sits inside of the score canvas and shows that the player is logged in and what their score is. So that everybody's got a symbol, a color, and a score. So you want to have each of those elements shown in the score canvas for every player. Uh, so uh, we're, in order to accomplish that, we're going to use an object called the player panel. In the project view, we're going to create a new material. Uh, <laughs> the same step that we start do every day, Pinky. Um, and that material is going to be called UI text. And then let's set it from uh, the lit to uh, UI unlit transparent. So UI unlit transparent. And then the render queue is going to go from 3000 to 3050. That's transparent plus 50. Uh, so that's going to make it uh, show up uh, on, uh, in front uh, and above things. In front of and above things. Um, and let's go ahead and just put the coloration to full white there on the uh, tint <coughs> just to be sure and then um, we're going to go ahead and go to the hierarchy and create a new game object in the score canvas so click on score canvas again right click and create empty and it's going to be a new rect transform uh, because that's part of the canvas element as opposed to a regular transform. Um, and we're going to rename this player panel and set the width to 100 and the height to 50. And add a player canvas controller script to it. And go ahead and set the haptic multiplier to 100 instead of 10. And then add a color things script. And add a UI text object. Um, That UI text object is going to get renamed to symbol. And that, and then we hold Control Alt and Shift and click on the symbol, uh, the, the location, and click on the lower right hand corner. And then set left to 50 and right to 0. And change the text to app. 
which is our default symbol. Uh, this is just going to represent our symbol in the scene. Um, and then go ahead and set the best fit center vertically and horizontally. Let's change the color over to white so we can see it in the scene. And there it is right there inside of the game view. Um, and let's set the material to that UI text that we made earlier. And uh, that's going to make it really pop. Um, and then we're going to add an outline component, which will also help. Uh, and outline here, let's go full black, full alpha, 255 value uh, when you click on the effect color there. Um, and that adds a really nice outline effect to any text that you have in the scene. <coughs> And then click on symbol and duplicate it. Uh, you can press Command D or Control D to duplicate it. Um, and then set the name um, of this to score. And left should go to zero and right should become 50. And set the default value uh, to double lot and then click back on player panel and drag the symbol object onto the player symbol property of the player canvas controller of player panel and then drag the score object onto the player points property of the player canvas controller and then save your game and drag the player panel onto the prefabs folder that's going to create a player panel prefab. Click on the player panel and delete it from the scene and remember because you can always summon more of them by just dragging this player panel back out of your prefabs collection and uh, <clears throat> save your game again because we like saving a lot and also remember to like the video and subscribe. All right, next step is to build the bubble target prefabs. Um, these bubble targets uh, are, uh, the game uses four different colors of bubble, each worth different point scores. Uh, we're going to build one of them, then make duplicates of it, and tweak the settings on the duplicate to make each target unique. We're also going to use a new feature called Shader Graph to build the bubble texture and learn a bit more about building reflective objects like the bubbles. Um, and it's going to be a lot of fun. Um, so let's, uh, in the project um, view, uh, go ahead and get into the materials and create a new PBR graph which is going to be in Create and Shader, which is near the top. And then in there is PBR Graph. And uh, we're going to name this Lit Bubbles. And we're going to go ahead and double click Lit Bubbles. And that's going to open up the shader graph view of uh, the of the object lit bubbles. Um, now its output is this PBR master module uh, that you see right here in the middle of the the screen. Um, you can uh, you can middle click anywhere and move around in here, and we're going to move to the left a little bit and uh, start creating our own. Um, uh, effects. So the first thing we're going to add is what's called a Fresnel effect. Uh, so right click at, to create node and look up our FRES Fresnel effect and uh, we get this Fresnel effect box um, which has uh, an input of world space for the normal view direction 
and a times one power level uh, for the power. Uh, we're going to take the mapping um, values of this Fresnel um, and drag it out uh, into the, 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 the world and make this a sample cube map. Um, and we're going to put it on normal uh, uh, as far as the input goes. Um, so uh, this cube map um, should be a cube map from the scene. And uh, we've actually got one of those from the reflection probe that we created right at the beginning. Uh, in addition to that, you're going to have to jump into the lighting window, um, which is found in window, general, rendering, excuse me, window, rendering, lighting settings, and then here in scene, uncheck the auto generate button if it is checked, and click the generate button generate lighting button. Um, it's going to generate a really simple light map because there's really just not much in the scene and then I'm going to get rid of that tab. Um, but with that light map generated uh, there will be an available uh, cube map for you to set as the input cube map here. Um, so you can then go back and set the reflection probe from the scene as the sample cube map value. And then We're going to take this output and drag it to the emission value of our PBR master. So and now um, the preview doesn't St still doesn't like really uh, look right. Um, so we're going to set some some values uh, uh, on it overall. Uh, the first thing we're going to do um, is add a an additional uh, Fresnel effect uh, output node, um, th and this one that. This one's just by itself. And we're going to set the power on this front L to 3. And then drag its output node onto the metallic and the occlusion uh, nodes of the, of the output. And that's going to give us a reflection only on a specific color. Um, and we also want to be able to set the color of this albedo output. Um, so let's go ahead and add a property called color and make sure you change these references because they can really trip you up later on if you don't and it's good to get in that habit um, and let's default this to a light blue color um, that we are going to make our bubbles uh, by default and make sure that your alpha is set on this um, maybe something reasonable for bubble coloration we're going to say 164 alpha. Um, and uh, so this color value doesn't actually set anything yet, though. So we're going to drag it out into the, into the uh, shader here and then drag its output node into the, onto the albedo value for our uh, view. Now, um, I also want this to get input on the alpha channel. Uh, so I'm going to drag it out, but I can't just drag it right onto alpha. Um, I have to 
split it first uh, so that there is just the alpha channel coming off of the color here. And I'm going to put that number onto the alpha value. Um, and that way, uh, the color that we are setting um, in our, our value here changes just the alpha input or output on the on the master um, setting. Uh, let's see. So um, let's also set it up so that that reflection probe can be set externally. So let's click on plus up here and get cube map. That's what reflection probes are. And uh, we can rename this reference. And let's go ahead and drag Reflection Probe out and put it out onto Cube here. Um, and, and then default that value to the Reflection Probe from the scene. Um, and boy, is my alpha making no difference at all? Or is it just me? Well, we'll have to see. Uh, anyhow, um, <laughs> look at uh, my reference here. Okay. Uh, we want to set the reflection power. We want to make this available as a, as a setting uh, because it really kind of can change the um, way that the, the bubble looks. Um, the default setting of one is pretty good, uh, but, but who knows uh, what people are going to want to set that for. So let's go ahead and expose that as a vector one. Um, and we're, we're going to call it reflection power. And some reason that locked up my shader graph again. So I'm going to close the tab and save and then double click the thing to get the editor back open. And it seems to happen every time I add a uh, external property. That's a new thing for me. But um, whatever. We, we've gotten around it. Um, let's drag reflection power onto the power value there. Um, and then set this default to 1 so that it has a, a setting. And now we've got some um, really uh, reflective, lit up. Uh, let's Let's also uh, change some values here uh, of the of the output um, on the the smoothness setting um, of the PBR master. If we change that to point nine, it'll make it oh a lot shinier. And then let's also set the alpha clipping on uh, this from point five to point one. Um,
that, that'll, that's going to do for now. Um, I think that's everything, actually. Uh, so that creates the, the Lit Bubbles shader. So click on the Save Asset button there at the top. Um, and then go ahead and create a new material based on a Lit Bubble shader named Blue Bubble. Um, so materials create material and we're going to call it blue bubble um, and we're going to go ahead and make sure that we're using this new shader that we just built a um, couple of ways of doing that um, but we're going to click on this arrow right here and go to shader graphs and then lit bubbles and then set the color to a nice light blue um, and all this is good stuff um, and then once we've got our blue bubble uh, set, we're going to duplicate it three times and we're going to rename um, one of those and call it green. And then, as a joke, make it a purple. <laughs> as a trick on yourself in the future. Um, so, and then add a red bubble as the last. Okay. So, we've got our material set up. And... Let's go into the hierarchy and create a new game object. So create empty and then reset. And we're going to name it target bubble blue. And then we're going to go ahead and change the scale on target bubble blue to uh, 1.2, 1.2. 1.2 and uh, this is the largest bubble in the lot so it's going to be large bulky and move slowly it's worth the least number of points um, but uh, hey that's uh, that's just the way things work out for, for blue bubbles in this game so we're going to add a selection controller component and that's add component selection and this selection controller is one of the scripts that I wrote this lets you select things. And this is the object that's being selected. Um, we're going to go ahead and add a rigid body to the, to the thing. Uh, and then set its mass to 0.1. Uh, this is going to make it uh, float, um, but 0 0.01. Not just 0 0.1, 0 0.01. But its acceleration into that float is going to be really um, affected by drag because it has minimal weight to counteract that. So um, our drag value of 0.5 is going to be pretty significant for that bubble. Um, and we're going to um, add an activation timer component. And that activation timer should have a duration of 30. That's going to give each bubble 30 seconds to be active. Um, and then we're going to add a sphere collider to, to the... And with a radius of 0.5, uh, 
that means it's always going to be consistently on scale at 1.2 in every direction uh, for the because the radius is half um, and then we're going to add a player points module to this a player points component and reward points of one and a cooldown of one is appropriate um, we're also going to add a zigzag physics component and uh, X on to 1 and Z to 1 and leave Y at 0. Uh, that's going to not change its vertical force but move it around uh, in the scene um, according to some semi random. And then the max deviation on that should remain at 0.1. Um, and then the we're going to also add an animator controller. component um, which is later on going to be linked into the animator that we're going to add to this object um, and we're also going to add an animator on enable we're going to add a sphere to the target bubble blue so right click on target bubble blue so select it in the hierarchy right click on it go to 3d object and sphere and remove this sphere collider from sphere um, and then drag the blue bubble material onto that sphere and then yeah and then a wind zone 3d object wind zone go ahead and set the main strength on this one to two excuse me the direction this is spherical the radius to three and leave that um, main strength to two that's good um, and then we're going to create a new particle system in here it's in effects new effects particle system and we're going to name this trailing bubbles <coughs> and then we're going to leave looping checked uh, we're going to go to duration and set it to four and lifetime should be left at five and let's see start speed go ahead and change it to random between two constants the low end is 0.375 and high end is 0.75 and and the start size again let's make this random between two constants and then make that point zero one through point one and then the gravity modifier will set to point one and then make the simulation space for that world these are just bubbles that are going to accompany our bubble uh, in its journey uh, upwards. And uh, then let's make sure that play on awake is checked. Um, and if mission. go into shape and change the shape from cone to sphere and then make the radius 0.5 and the radius thickness 
one. And then, or actually, point zero one. This is only the very, very edge we want the bubbles to come out of. Um, and then check color over lifetime. And edit that gradient to set up the um, blend in, blend out, like we did with the other one. Um, so the first 5% and the end 5% should fade in and fade out. And then check the size over lifetime. And random two constants. And make it 0.5 to 1.5. And then check the noise box. And we'll go ahead and open it and set the position amount to 0.75 and the size amount to 0.2. And then set the renderer material to bubble particle. superb so click on it and duplicate it if you like it make a bunch of them and also remember to subscribe and click like down below and uh to rename the duplicate target bubbles hover and then change the emission rate over time to zero Um, and change plus to get hit a plus in here to get bursts and leave that first burst at 30 um, and uncheck the looping uh, modifier up here at the top okay save and then duplicate target bubbles hover and rename the duplicate target bubbles pop And set the start color on target bubbles pop to light blue. And set the duration uh, to 1.2. And set the start lifetime to 0.2 to 1.2. change the start speed uh, to between 5 and 2 and the gravity modifier to 1 and leave the simulation space world um, set the particles to five, the max particles to 500 and then go into the emission uh, burst here and change this count that says 30 to 100 and then check limit velocity over lifetime. Uh, set its speed to a down curve. And then add an audio source object to target bubbles pop. So audio, audio source. And in the audio source, uh, change the audio clip over to our bubble noise um, that is in sounds and change the output to the sound effects output on mixer and change its spatial blend from 2d over to full 3d and set the max distance to 100 And let's go ahead and add an audio pitch ranger component 
to this audio source, drag the audio source onto the pitch ranger, and change the pitch range to 0.15. And make sure that this sound effect audio source here is set to play on awake and not to loop. Um, and that's great. So then click on Tiger Bubbles Pop and deactivate it, and then click on Tiger Bubbles Hover and also deactivate it. And go back over and select Target Bubble Blue. Go back down to the animation window, which if it isn't available in your interface, you can find it at Window Render uh, rent General. No, no, Window Animation Animation. Um, and in the animation window, we're going to create a new animation with the Create button. Um, and as before, we're going to store this in Assets Animations, and we're going to name it Target Bubble Death Animation. And with the frame counter set to zero, press the Record button, and then find the Collider and deactivate it, and then find the sphere object and deactivate it and then deactivate emission on trailing bubbles and we're just deactivating the, the emission instead of deactivating it entirely uh, because that uh, gives it a way better cutoff um, and then press the record button to stop recording and then select all the animation frames and press Control c to copy them and then change the counter to 120 uh, press enter and then click in the animation window area here again and press Control v and it'll paste your new values at the end at 120 here um, and then click on the target bubble death animation name here and change it to create new clip and then uh, name this new clip target bubble idle animation and then go ahead and click on the record button with the frame counter set to zero and toggle the activate on the collider in target bubble blue when I say toggle that means like switch it to a different state and then back at, and then back again and then go to the sphere and toggle activate it and then on the emitter of trailing bubbles uh, go ahead and toggle activate it okay and then press record again to stop recording and then click on the idle animation again and create new clip and we're going to name this one touch animation or target bubble touch animation and with the frame counter set to zero press the record button and then deactivate the collide the sphere collider and then deactivate the sphere and then activate target bubbles pop and press record again to stop recording then select all the animation values these keys that were created in the animation timeline and press control C to copy them and then change the animation value to uh, the frame to 120 and then click in the animation keys again and press control V and uh, yeah that pastes the settings and now select target bubble blue in the hierarchy and then find the animator window um, 
this is a state machine that allows you to control animations. Now we just made all of those three animations and they should be piled up inside of that state machine. Um, state machines are a handy way to keep track of what's happening and provide logic to move from one state to another state. And so it can just keep doing the thing that is in that state. Um, and uh, using a series of state machines, you can logic out just about anything. So the state machines are a handy attachment to the animator system. Um, so in the animator window, which is available in, and this is different from animation window, this is the animator window. And in window, you go to window and then animation and then animator um, in order to get to it. And uh, if it's currently showing layers, then you just need to click on the parameters button up tab up here at the top. And uh, then we're going to add hover, touch, end, and spawn parameters. And they're all triggers. So hover and touch and end and spawn. OK. And then we're going to set the idle animation as the default layer state. Um, and then we're going to make a transition from any state to idle animation. Um, and this transition has to be dependent on spawning. So when it's spawned, it resets to the default uh, animation state, no matter what animation state it's been moved to uh, in the interim. Um, and then we're going to create a new transition to target bubble touch animation. Um, and we're going to make that transition uh, dependent upon um, the condition of touch. And then another transition that goes to death that just always goes from touch into death so that it because that's what follows being touched for a bubble um, so uh, which is which is sad it's a tragic story all about bubbles um, catch it now in your local full dome <laughs> and so now now that we have the transition set up um, this one requiring touch this one requiring spawn um, we can link the animation, the animators, to the various control modules here in at the target bubble blue animator on enable and an animator controller components. So just drag target bubble blue onto the animator value on each of these uh, components. And that is the target bubble blue. So now that we have it built, um, okay, so to finish up target bubble blue, um, we're going to get into the selection controller and uh, we're going to set the target bubbles hover as the selection object in selection hover. Um, and we just set both of the animators. Um, we're also going to want to add a component of player points. Uh, this is what gives players the number of points that they get when they actually pop the bubble. Kind of an important component for games and for the for the uh, enemies in the game, which is I, this is what that's what this is a, the, a target, I suppose. Um, so now that we have the target uh, completed with player points and the selection controller linked, um, we're going to make a prefab out of it. So we're going to drag target bubble blue into prefabs and that creates this prefab right here and then with it selected we're going to duplicate it three times one two three and then open it up open up the first duplicate uh, let's rename this first duplicate target bubble red and it'll ask if you want to rename the file and you do want to rename the file otherwise they're all going to remain various uh, versions of target bubble blue and uh, yeah, maybe you want that but I don't. Um, and so target bubble red, we should drag the material onto the sphere. And then in the target bubbles pop, 
I change it to a color of red, and then go back into Target Bubble Red here, and we're going to go from 1.2 to size 1. And then we're also going to decrease the drag to 0.3. And we're going to increase the reward points to two because, boy, this is a this is a more valuable bubble because it uh, has less drag. It's going to move faster and jerk around more. Um, okay, so they save that and then press the back arrow. It gets us back into the scene um, and go ahead and rename this one to Target Bubble Yellow and then open it and. Its size is going to be 0.9 across the board, and it's worth three points, and its drag should be 0.25. Again, that increases the speed, and it's a smaller bubble, and so now it's worth a good three three whole points. Um, <coughs> now, And uh, yeah, we're going to need to change the material here on target bubble on yellow to uh, the previously made yellow bubble. And that gets, just gets dragged onto the sphere object. And um, let's see. So we got our points changed. We got our size changed. Um, let's take the pop bubbles and make those yellow too. Okay. That's done. So we're going to press back and save. Um, and then we're going to click on the Target Bubble Blue 3 here. And we're going to rename it to Green. And Target Bubble Green is 0.8 across the board. And it's worth five points. And its drag is only, what, 0.1? Yeah, 0.1. And so we'll double click it and 0.8 across the board. OK, that was right. Um, and, and it is worth five points. Oh, I just didn't drag it into the, onto the right thing. So here, target green bubble onto sphere okay um but that's all of the bubbles uh so that's that's most of the game right now the next part that we're going to do is the introduction oh i just deleted the target bubble because we have these uh prefabs now that 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 we can drag out so anytime i want i can drag a blue one out i can drag a green one out uh, red one uh, yellow and, and we get a good idea of what they look like in the in the scene. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and delete those again because they're just prefab instances, and we can do whatever we want with them. All right, so we've got all the prefabs built. Uh, now it's time to set the scene for the players and explain to them what they need to do to actually play the game. Uh, we're going to explain all of this in canvas elements that have their own fade in and fade out animation. Um, so go to the hierarchy and create a new UI canvas object. For that, go to UI and then canvas. And then within canvas, change the canvas to world space. Uh, this is what we get. This, this is for our, um, uh, nothing else really will view in our uh, game. Um, unless it's in world space. Um, so reset the rect transform on the object and then set position Z to 30. And we can actually look in the game here. Um, at position Z of 30 and then width to 1000, height to 200. So one more is it? Oh. And uh, the scale, we're going to set to 10% across the board. And we're going to go ahead and add a UI. Oh, we're going to name this Detail Canvas. And create a new UI text object inside of there. 
and we're going to hold down Control Alt and Shift at the same time, and then click on this uh, uh, positioning widget, and then click on the lower right-hand corner, and uh, that'll that'll set it to the right location. Um, and then go ahead and change the text in this to a full dome game by your name here. And I'm going to say Balin. And we're going to set the fonts on this to Arise Bold, uh, which is Arise and then font style bold. And um, we're going to set the font size uh, to 50. And the horizontal and vertical, both to center. And we're going to change the color on this over to a nice uh, teal color. And set the material on this to UI text, which we created earlier. Uh, so you can click on the, you can uh, find UI text material and drag it onto that material spot. And that'll give us a nice bright text. And uh, then we're going to get into the alpha on the color and set that to zero. I like this to be a little bit lighter aqua. Okay, and let's just have a look at what that looks like. Yeah, that's great. Okay, so alpha of zero, and that's where we're starting. Now we're going to make an animation um, out of that. Uh, so click on the text object, and then click down here, go to your animation view, which you can get to with window and animation, animation, if it's not available. So click on the text and then click on create here in animation clip. Um, name it uh, the animation uh, text fade in out 5s and put it in your animations folder. Um, and uh, I, I, this is just a generic, really quick animation that, that will fade the text in and then fade it back out again to make it look good when it's popping up. Um, so we're going to set the frame counter to zero and press the record button and then set the alpha on the text to any value and then back to zero again and that will animate that value so it recorded it um, and then we're going to set the frame counter to 30 and we're going to set the alpha of the text to full 255 value and then we're going to go to um, 270 on the frame counter and go back into the, the alpha. And we're going to just, just mess with it a little bit and take it back up to 255. So that'll mark it as 255. And then we're going to go to frame counter 300, which is actually five seconds in. And we're going to set the alpha of the text back to zero. Okay, and we're going to press record again to finish recording. I'm going to hit the play button on here so we can see how it looks. And that's how it looks. Now, if you'd like to see the whole animation, you can just move your mouse over the window here and press the A button, and it will show you all of the things that are in that animation area. Um, it's a pretty common way of uh, that Unity uses for zooming. Um, now that we have that recorded, we're going to use it repeatedly, uh, and we're going to sh show multiple detail canvases. So uh, we'll go ahead and create a new empty game object and reset it, and we're going to name this Game Intro. And then we're going to copy, uh, we're going to uh, move detail canvas into game intro. Um, and then inside of game intro, we're going to add an audio source. 
So right click on it and go to audio, audio source. And uh, we're going to name this intro music. And we're going to change this over to the fun and games track uh, one, that's one minute and three seconds long. And this goes to the background music. Okay. And we want to leave that on play and away. Um, and we want to deactivate the detail canvas. So click on detail canvas and then click on this checkbox up here to deactivate it. And then we're going to duplicate detail canvas 11 times. So click it and then use the control D or command D uh, 11 times. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. Okay. And then we're going to change the text in, in all of the canvases to talk about the game. So uh, if you press the Alt button and then click on the arrow, it will close everything that is in it. And likewise, when you open, it will um, open everything in it. And since we're changing the text, we want these exposed. So let's click on text and change this to bubble destroyer. Oops. Let me go ahead and spell it right so we don't look ridiculous. And, and then the next one here, we'll leave it as a full go game, dome game built by Balin. And then this is built with Unity 3D. Now we're just going to say Unity because the 3 is really not so cool looking in the font that I picked out. Um, and some instructions. And more instructions. And more instructions. And some credit for the sounds that I got from freesound.org um, and for the soundtrack that uh, that we that we got from the unity store this SD soundtracks fun and games and some more instructions. <laughs> I think this one will just change to get ready to play. Okay, so now we got 12 canvases, and when the text is displayed in each of these canvases, it will um, show for five seconds and then disappear again. Um, so let's go ahead and click on game intro. We're going to create a new animation for game intro. So with it selected, go into your animation window and hit create. And we're going to call this animation game intro. And go ahead and press the record button. 
and with the frame counter set to zero, select all of the detail canvas game objects and activate and disable them again. And that will register that game, act game object activation uh, with it. Um, and go ahead and set the frame counter to 300. And I want you to select the first detail canvas and enable it. And then go to a frame counter of 600. And go ahead and disable Detail Canvas and enable Detail Canvas 1. And then go to 900 and disable Detail Canvas 1 and enable Detail Canvas 2. And then go to 1200 and disable Detail Canvas 2, enable Detail Canvas 3, and 1500. getting the pattern here and change it to 1800 and 2100 And then go to 2400, and 3000. I suppose I should go another three up and disable Detail Canvas 11. And we'll go ahead and click record to finish recording. And the next part that we're going to build is called the Game Operations Component. Um, it handles the spawning of items during play, limits its sequence for bubble popping, and sets the um, match gameplay. Um, it uh, does a lot of handling of music, too. Um, so uh, in the hierarchy, we're going to go ahead and create a new game object and reset its transform and then rename it uh, Game Container. And then go ahead and add a new com add object to it of, a, of an audio source. So uh, right click and go to audio and audio source and change the audio source to background music. And we're going to go ahead and change the audio clip over to fun and games, one minute loop verses um, and set the output mixer as BGM because this is background music and check the loop button. Um, this one should also be set to a volume of 0.5. Um, we might do that with the other uh, intro music also, um, but yeah, and uh, go ahead and after you've gotten it set up like that, deactivate it, so uncheck that box. And then we need to create the end game screen. So let's create a new empty UI canvas. So right click in here and go to UI, 
and canvas and then switch it from screen space to world space and reset the transform and then set position Z to 30 and set width to 1000 and height to 100 and or height to 200 and then the rotation X should be meg 33 and then on scale set it all the way to 10% that's 0.1 across the board and then go ahead oh and rename this end game and we're going to go ahead and add an end game a, com a game end component um, to this uh, script that actually does the the work of, of ending the game um, and let's go ahead and drag an instance of the player panel prefab into the end game object so go find your prefabs and then drag player panel inside of that and we're going to go ahead and rename this one winner panel um, and go ahead and make a copy of the game intro detail canvas so click on game intro find detail canvas and duplicate it with control D and then drag that into the end game and we're going to go ahead and change the text on detail canvas here to the winner is and if you want to see that that's how it's going to look um, it, it isn't lit up right now because we have that animation on it that uh, shows for five seconds and then and then dims it back out again so um, and then after we've got all of that set up so the winner panel is in there we're going to go ahead and click on end game and deactivate it so game container uh, now contains background music that's deactivated and end game that is deactivated um, now we're going to create the spawners so go back up to game container and create a new empty object and rename it spawners and set the transform position on spawners uh, to y of negative 2 um, and then go ahead and create a new empty game object inside of spawners and we're going to call this spawn rotator blue and inside of spawn rotator blue uh, we're going to create a new empty game object and this one is going to be called spawn location near and the Z on it should be set to 3 and let's go ahead and duplicate spawn location near twice um, and name the first duplicate spawn location mid and set the Z to 7 and the y to neg three and then rename the last one spawn location far and it's going to be a y of neg 5.5 and a z of 11.5 okay and then we're going to click back on spawn rotator blue an add component and make that a spawner with a spawner component and the spawn item is a prefab and we want to drag the target bubble blue prefab onto that and then we want to drag each of the spawn locations onto the spawn location setting and then um, we want to set the spawn count to 15 and I'm going to go ahead and with it selected 
um, and we're going to go to the animation window and hit create and this is going to be called spawn rotator and in spawn uh, after we have the animation window open um, we're going to click record and then we're going to change the rotation value and set it back to zero again um, so click on on spawn rotator blue and just set any value in, or in any rotation and then change it back to zero um, and then set the frame counter to 30 and we're going to set the y to 45 and then set the frame counter to 60 and we're going to set y to neg 45 and then set the frame counter to 90 and we're going to set the the y back to zero um, and that'll keep it rotating and uh, so while it's spawning it's going to make an arc of 90 degrees in front of the audience um, which is uh, well in, I say in front but you know it's full dome so the sweet spot of the of the area um, so then with that recording done we're going to press the record button to end the recording and then select spawn rotator blue I'm going to press the arrow next to it so it minimizes. And then we're going to make three duplicates of it. Duplicate, duplicate, duplicate. And then we're going to rename the first duplicate Spawn Rotator Red. And we're going to drag the target bubble red onto its spawn item. And then we're going to change this one to target bubble yellow. and we're going to go ahead and drag the target bubble yellow prefab onto it and then for this one it's going to be you guessed it target bubble green and we're going to drag the target bubble green onto it spawn rotator green excuse me um and then select all of them and deactivate them and we're going to make game intro a child of game container by dragging game intro into game container and then we're going to reselect game container and in the animation window create a new animation for the game container so hit create and this one is going to be called game runner and go ahead and click record and with the frame counter set to zero toggle background music on and then back off again and then toggle the end game on and back off again and then lock the animation window okay so that's going to be this little lock button right here so click the lock icon on it that will keep the animation from changing out of game container even when we go into the spawners which have their own rotators so that little lock icon is up here uh, up here and it's kind of hard to see but you can click on it um, and then uh, select all the spawn rotator game objects and spawn and spawners and toggle them and then set the frame counter to 3600 And we're going to go ahead and deactivate game intro. And then set the background music to active. And then select all the spawn rotator items and activate them. And then we're going to set the frame counter to. 10,800. Um, I think it gives us a three minute game or maybe a two minute game. Um, and uh, this is the end. Um, we're going to deactivate all of the spawn rotator game objects. So just uncheck them after having set this to 10,800. 10, um, then deactivate the background music and then activate the end game object and 
set the frame counter to 11,400. And then deactivate the end game. And go ahead and click the record button to finish the animation recording. And then remember to unlock the animation window uh, using the little lock icon right there. Um, okay. All right, now we're gonna build the game controller. That's, uh, that's we're almost done. I know it's been a real uh, trial, but uh, uh, thanks for sticking with me. Now, this is gonna connect to the server and uh, you actually can build your own server also. There's an example one set up at firedome.heroku app, which we're gonna be connecting to right now. But um, uh, there's another video which explains how to set up an instance of this, uh, what's called Fondle Slab server. Um, and this is a, another program that I came up with that lets people interact with the dome using their phone. Um, so uh, go ahead and create a new game object in the hierarchy. So right click and create empty and reset the object. And we're gonna name this game controller. And we're gonna add a game controller script to it. And that automatically also adds a game data and a socket IO network script, um, which, is, which is pretty handy. Um, and then we're going to create a new uh, let's see, actually, we're going to select the player colors in here and change this from 0 to 12 and set them to a collection of bright colors um, that the... Uh, I'm going to go ahead and set the first one and then take it back down to one color and then go back up to 12 and that changes the color on everything and, and also sets the alpha across the board and makes it makes it easier for me to, to set all of the, the various colors for each of the items and uh, yeah, you want these to be like pretty bright um, uh, colors uh, the, the they, they won't show up very well if you don't make them bright um, and and you can select any color you want um, uh, uh, for this purpose whatever you think is best for your audience. Um, let's see. Um, coming up with a bunch of unique colors, 12 of them is actually, and, and having them all be bright is more difficult than you might think but you'll get a chance to experience this for yourself. What color do I use? What color do I use? Um, yeah. Do a more yellowy orange. Okay. And um, if they match, kind of, that's not so bad. Everybody gets a different symbol and a different color. So, um, and uh, there's an odd number of symbols by default and an even number of colors if you set it to 12. And that way it uh, always rotates through colors and symbols and nobody gets anything that matches. Um, we're going to go ahead and create a new 3D text object inside of Game Controller. Um, so 3D object and then 3D text that's down at the bottom. And we're going to name it Control URL. And um, the position uh, should be set to X neg 20, uh, Y neg 6, and uh, Z of 0. Uh, set the rotation Y to neg 90. Um, and then set the scale across the board to 0.1. And then set the font size uh, down here at the bottom to 200. And set the anchor to middle center. And then let's, let's make the color on this kind of an aqua color to match the rest of the things, the rest of the text in the game. And we're going to drag this control, or we're going to click on game controller and then drag this control URL object onto the uh, socket IO network show URL. 
and then we're going to drag the player prefab out of prefabs and onto the player option here on game controller. So go ahead and grab that, drag it in there. And then um, player panel gets dropped onto player canvas. And we're going to go ahead and create a new game object in the scene. And reset it. Important to reset it. Um, and we're going to name this the um, player spawn. And then back in game controller, we're going to drag player spawn onto the spawn container. Um, and then we're going to open up uh, our game container and find winner panel and drag that onto winner canvas. And then we're going to look for score canvas and drag that onto player list. And we'll leave the post game delay at five. And that is, that's the game, uh, or pretty much most of it. Save your game. Um, and this is when you can test it. You can press the play button. And the game should start. Now see the Earl changed to the short version of the Earl um, there on the left. And you can, uh, if, if you use the Fire Dome um, location that I set earlier, you can now go there with your phone and it will pop up an icon for you. Now, uh, this game is designed to sit here and play in loop um, and just allow people to pick up and play whenever they want. Um, you could uh, add additional logic that checks to see if there are people signed on and how many there are, and then launch different kinds of games or change the properties of the game. Um, there's lots of opportunities in here for changes and improvements um, just based on whatever it is that you would like to build this game into. Um, and see how we, once it starts we get all these bubbles popping up Okay, and there's a couple of cleanup things to do here at the very end. Um, I want you to go ahead and get into your hierarchy and right click and create an empty object. Um, reset it. And uh, we're going to name this Game Environment. And uh, you can drag the directional light into Game Environment. You can drag the the reflection probe, the floor, the roof, the fog container in both wind zones, and both of the bubble rings um, into the game environment. And that uh, that's just uh, it cleans up your uh, hierarchy here so that, that things that aren't going to change inside of the game are all inside of this, uh, this, this object. Um, and you can even get a little bit of additional performance by checking the static box on that and then say yes, change children. Um, and that'll just make it so that all of those game environment items are set and never change inside of the game and uh, take up a little bit less memory uh, because they are static. Um, not just less memory, but less processing power. They don't call as many update uh, frames uh, and, and other things inside of Unity. Anything that you can make static, you really should, um, is what that breaks down to. Anyway, um, and uh, one last thing to do uh, is a good idea to go into your lighting window. Um, so window, rendering, and lighting settings. Um, and then inside of your lighting settings, 
um, generate lighting again. Ma make sure this auto generate isn't checked. Um, and hit that generate lighting button. Um, and uh, that ensures that you're uh, ready to build. And uh, yeah, so that is the complete game. Now, at this point, you can do things like customize it. You can change those prefabs so there are other things. Um, you can do uh, a whole variety of, uh, of script changes um, by just getting in here and editing the, the scripts that I provided for you. Um, and uh, you can really build an, uh, just about um, any kind of game you really want uh, using that, in, in, that uh, input system that this comes with. Uh, you just have to write your own input module if you want to do something besides point and click style games like this one. Um, and uh, there's actually built into this the ability to select and move objects around in the scene too. So um, yeah, you can experiment with all of the scripts that are here and I hope that you've learned something and that, that you enjoyed this tutorial. Please remember to like my video and subscribe to this channel. Uh, and, uh, yeah, you guys do, do your thing. Um, I hope you do well at building your own dome application and, uh, please, uh, send some examples to me, uh, to tell to show me things that maybe you built using this. Anyway, have a great day.